Sorry about that, guys. We're back with the Incahumas and Cubs. So, off. So, it looks like they've stopped for a bit of a rest. Now, we could hear some zebras not too far from here. I think that's what the lioness heard a bit earlier. But it is getting warm, so they might rest up here for the rest of the day. Oh. Mom, I'm hungry. So it's going to be on the radio. Obi, Obi. Obi and Kormas crossed um, on Vertila Axis. Uh, we're just to the north of Sandy Patch. Sorry, I didn't copy, but there's um, only two stations here if you're interested. So Greg's wondering, how is the injured cub keeping up? Uh, it looks like that injury wasn't as serious as we initially thought. I'm trying to see where it is. Um, but all the cubs I've seen are walking quite well this morning. No, this one is, a, is the first time we saw this one. Okay, they're going back towards where we came from. Let's just zoot around. Just moving deeper into the shed. Now going back. Look at them. So that's one, two, three. And there are two more cubs off to the right slightly, suckling on mom. And none of them seem to be having too much of a problem walking. And they are incredibly resilient animals. How's that, Vim? There we go. So there's the other two. So we'll wait to see if they move. But I think it was one of those three cubs. One looked like it might have a slight limp. But they are incredibly quick to recover from muscle injuries. Ow! I'm trying to see what's happening. The other lionesses look like they're on the move, so I think she's going to do the same. Now, there were some zebra we could hear up ahead. Little greedy gutters. Look at that, isn't that just too cute? See, there's the one, actually, there's the one. Looks like it's got a bit of a limp, but still a massive recovery and uh, improvement from when we last saw that little cub walking around. Okay, looks like they're on the move again. Hold on, hold on, isn't this exciting? Now, while we try to get around to where these lions are moving to, uh, let's go to another cat and some more cubs.
Well, we've come back to this beautiful, beautiful leopard. Karula is just laying there surveying the scene. Her babies are just about to come up and pounce on her. I think we're going to see something lovely just here. <laughs> oh, isn't that great? Perfect timing to come back, folks. Isn't that great? Her little seven-month-old cubs... Gosh, that is just fantastic. We've been waiting here for this to happen. Exactly what is happening. Some of this maternal care is what I always love to see. And uh, she's definitely a top mum. She's got two cubs and she's moving down to back to where that kill is that she's stashed. We've just, here comes the other cub now, Brian, just down the same location. So that's fantastic to see. How beautiful are they? And this little guy's going to stalk and pounce on his mum and his brother or sister. I can't quite make out who's who of the two. There's a male and a female. And just watching there, watching mum and other sibling play. And I think there could be a little stalk on. There's a very, very dangerous dangerous cub there. We've got a question from Lou Butterfrog. Uh, question of my favourite baby animal in the bush. Well, yes, I do, actually. I have to tell you, it's elephant. Baby elephants are just incredibly funny to watch and wonderful to be around. And uh, if you've got a comfortable herd, a breeding herd, with, uh, you know, the females are comfortable with us being in their, in their proximity or, you know, in their presence. It is really lovely to see the little baby elephants. But thank you very, very much, Lou, for your question and welcome aboard. We've got our, at the moment, we're with another f beautiful cub or beautiful baby. And that is one of Karula's cubs. And he's just watching his brother or sister play with his mum down, we can't quite see because they're in a very tricky spot but when I say tricky spot, tricky spot for us absolutely fantastic spot for them uh, it's down in a drainage line or a dry creek bed down there and she has stashed the the kill that she made yesterday morning uh, she hasn't put it in a tree and the reason for that is she's got it down there for her cubs to eat, it's quite difficult for Brian to see I'm in a really tricky spot I'm sort of torn between two lovers here I can just see a little bit of interaction happening down there but I've also got this beautiful vision of this other other baby up the top this other cub so when they do when this other little cub goes down and has a has a bit of a pounce we might uh, reposition ourselves but look at that and it's just a miniature version of his mum absolutely beautiful seven months old and I don't know if you caught the uh, drive earlier when we were we were talking to the schools but I sort of compared the weight of these uh, little guys when they're born and it's about I'm really apologize about my conversions here but uh, ounces to, to grams I'm going to try for about about 600 grams is about 20 ounces of roughly so about the weight of three oranges you know when uh, when they're born that's a big that's a big cub or biggish cub but now they're getting up to some some really great size and getting some great condition on them as well Got a nice question from Linda. <laughs> He's moving off now. We might just reposition. But Linda, your question is: um, How long ago was the first time that I met Karula? Well, it was back in 2014. Um, I met uh, Mr. Q, quarantine the leopard, the male leopard, well before I met Karula. Uh, but then I met Karula in that same that same stint here, which was the 2014 Big Cat Live. Um, Big Cat Week, sorry, uh, here. And she's just 
she's just incredible. She's just one of these leopards that so habituated, so conditioned, so tolerant of us and knows that we're no threat to her. We've seen her come through with her cubs. We've seen ups and downs. We've seen so much with her and she just tolerates. Last night, I'm not sure if you were watching, but um, I had the privilege of having a bit of a, a warm-up drive for today and uh, went out with the team and we were just sitting over here, Brian and I, and we were sitting in a location where we were well away from her and she decided to scale the tree right next to us. Now, we would never go that close to uh, a leopard in a tree uh, for fear of disturbing her or, or whatever or changing her behavior, but she came to us. So she was at our eye level of only about 15 feet away from us. It was a, a major lovely, lovely moment. I'm going to try and reposition for us. Thank you for your question. Um, so it was about two years ago, but many of you watching know Karula much better than I do and have been with her ever since she was born about t 12 years ago. Uh, so while I'm repositioning, um, we might link to Jamie and see what she's up to. Something interesting, I am sure. We'll see you now. Oh, I'm up a termite amount if in terms of what we're up to you wanted to know what we were doing. We've skedaddled, as I said, to... Oh no, I dropped what I wanted to show you. And keep it there. We've skedaddled to quarantine in the open areas around Zoe's just so that we stay out of the way of anything that might happen to be moving in this direction. Particularly because this wind is still... It's gusting, which is even worse because you never know when to expect the next gust. It doesn't seem to be able to pick a direction. And it just gets... It gets more and more unsafe when you're in thick vegeta vegetated areas. And then at the same time, you've also got to be careful because when you walk across open areas, you're very much lulled into a false sense of security. But you actually don't have safe places unless you plan your route. You don't necessarily have safe places that you can race off to, like termite mounds or big trees. So it's important never to be lulled into a false sense of security, especially after the day that we've morning that we've had, which has been fun but has involved many, many elephant approaches. Now, one day I'm going to fall getting down a termite mountain like this, but not today. It will happen one day. And what I wanted to show you was something many of you have seen before, and that is the large devil thorn seed, which very cleverly, and of course there's lots of different approaches in terms of seed dispersal. This one is perhaps one of the most brutal which is basically stick into the bottom of somebody's foot. Usually an elephant or maybe into the gaps between a buffalo hoof or an impala hoof, but mostly it will be something like an elephant or a rhino or a human being, because this does stick very, very well into the bottom of one's shoe, which is actually how I found this one. I'm going to fall down now. That wasn't very coordinated. Now essentially, it does just that to the bottom of an elephant's foot or something similar. And by that way, the seed is dispersed. Wherever that animal happens to go, eventually at some point it will scuff its foot and the seed will disappear and go off elsewhere. So a completely different approach, for example, to our marula seeds. And this is actually a really perfect example of the marula seeds and where they've been eaten by squirrels. But instead of having a nice nasty spike that sticks into somebody's foot, the marula tree produces a delicious edible fruit that all of the animals like to eat, particularly elephants, and they will swallow it whole and then, as we spoke about before, with their ineffective digestive systems, basically defecate out half a marula fruit. And then they've got their seeds have got homemade fertilizer and they've been distributed. And then we've got lots of, of course, the grasses tend to focus more on wind pollination, but we can't really talk about that right now because there's not very much grass, really, or indeed grass seeds anywhere around the place. So we'll keep going, we'll keep looking for interesting... Actually, you know what? Where's that marula seed gone? I want to keep it. It was quite a nice example of one. Yeah, I want to keep it. Because it always looks... If you get it at the right angle, it almost looks like some little animal's skull with the eye holes. Anyway, I'm going to keep that. And we shall carry on. Now, sticking to the open areas, and the first thing that you notice about this particular spot 
is the change in vegetation and the arrival of what are known as bush encroacher species. Oh, by the way, Herbert has just told us, he said to us, if you ever find yourself walking in the bush, you don't ever want to walk on something like this. Step around it. He said, you must go around it. You must be careful. Because, he said, this is where the black mumbers like to go. Now, this is one of their favorite spots to go and hide, apparently, which I didn't know. But it sort of makes sense. You have this instinctive, as a human being, you can call it an instinctive avoidance of picking up things, going into wood piles, things where you can't really see exactly what's happening, but at the same time you know that something would probably choose that as a nice hiding spot. That wasn't actually what I was going to talk to you about. I was going to talk to you about these sickle bush trees, because we've got a whole range of them here. Now, sickle bush is known as the bush encroacher species. Herbert's just been telling me that you can whip up a, a toothache potion from their roots, and that probably really does work. They probably do have painkiller properties. These are sickle bushes, also known as the flat, one of the flat tire trees, because these, these thorns are actually modified branches. They're not technically thorns, they're spines. Thorns are modified leaves. These are relatively small ones. But you see how it's growing? If you look, you get an idea of this area as a whole. You've got sickle bush, sickle bush, sickle bush, sickle bush, sickle bush, sickle bush, and a couple of acacias as well. And that immediately tells us something about this area. It tells us that at some point this area was actually damaged in some way. Probably by overgrazing. Now bear in mind that at one point this area you know, obviously it was wild at one point, but after that it was used as farmland. Quarantine clearings was where cows were quarantined. And what ultimately happens then with farming practices and with um, ineffective farming practices is that overgrazing messes up the grass balance with the tree balance and you get what are known as these bush encroacher species, usually the sickle bush. Now elephants, if you've got elephants around, they help to maintain that cover, but no self-respecting elephant eats a sickle bush this size. Maybe if a sickle bush is about my height and still quite thin and bendy and green, they will consider clearing it away. These guys, absolutely not. And they're very, very difficult to get rid of. You have to up, if you want to try and, we wouldn't do it here, because this isn't as serious. I mean, I've been into sickle bush thickets where you can't see in your hand in front of your face almost. And if you do want to rehabilitate an area, you actually have to seriously, seriously drag, pull uproot, burn afterwards because otherwise what you do is you create a seed bank for the next set of sickle bush. So whilst they are valuable trees in high numbers they are definitely not what you want to see around here. So this is an area that's clearly been damaged in some way. It's also where you've got the change of the soil types because it's the end of the seep line and the beginning of a crest so it all oh, goodness dancing around sickle bush. Let's see and this just by the way these are the seeds. <laughs> and I've seen bushbuck. <laughs> we saw it the other day at the at Voyatella Lodge. Let me get into the sun. I've seen a bushbuck put an entire one of these in his mouth. He looked like, you know when you have a gobstopper or something similar, or you take a mouthful of apple or something that's too large. His cheeks were bulging as he munched away. It was sort of sticking out of his cheek like this. They make great Christmas decorations, by the way, if you spray paint them and give them a sort of a different colour. Homemade Christmas decorations work particularly well. All right, I'm only making my way. The wind has dropped now. So I feel like we made a fuss about nothing. I'm sure you're wondering, because it's been a morning where you have been spoiled for choice in terms of baby cats. Let's go back to Brent and his. Are we still sitting with the Inkahuma pride? And... Looks like they've found a good spot to rest for the day on the edge of an acacia thicket. And there's a pile of cubs all sleeping with one of the lactating females. Well, there's one or two cubs still feeding. One on the one female and the other on the other. There we go. And the rest of the pride flopping over. I've been on the move quite a bit this morning and judging from, I saw them yesterday it looks like they have definitely eaten something last night but something quite small and the one female still got a bit of pinkish around her neck you can't really see it at the moment but I think they did make a kill last night 
nothing particularly big there. And you noticed, and we've heard some zebra calling not far from here, and they picked up their ears immediately. But now it's a bit warm to be hunting, and it's time for snoozing in the shade. Are just too sweet even when they're snoozing. Okay, there's two still feeding. Oh, one lioness looked like she heard something. Popped her head up. Now there's quite a strong wind, well not strong, a stiff breeze blowing. It might have picked up a scent as well. But of course their hearing is infinitely better than ours. And lions are opportunists, so if something happened to wander in here... Oh, look at this, there's definitely something up. Look at that, that focus. Now quite often they might hear something and then just go back to snooze. But if an animal happened to wander in here, they would take advantage of it. They are Incredible opportunists. Well, Amber in Colorado is wondering how far a male lion's roar can be heard from. Uh, from a human being, you can hear a male lion's roar at about 10 to, 10 to 15 kilometers, depending on wind and, and weather. But uh, from a lion, they can probably hear it for about over 20. But I don't think they were reacting to a, a lion roar. It's unlikely for lions to roar at this time of the day. Uh, what7, who's a brand new viewer on Safari Live, a huge welcome, is wondering, do lions help raise each other's cubs? Yes, they do. The genetic strength in lions is in the females, in the pride. So all the females will help with the, the hunting and are very tolerant of the little cubs, even if they not, happen not to be their babies. Quite a peaceful scene now. It's quite warm, the cubs are going to snooze. <laughs> it's bad. Um, unfortunately, Mike's got a flat tire next to the lions, and it's a really flat tire. It's, it's not even a, a a half flat tire, it's a dead tire. I'm glad it's not me. I didn't have to figure out how to change a tire next to some lines. I've done it before. And I think I'm going to give Mike a hand quickly. So while we do that, let's go see what HT's up to. So we left Karula, and how cool is that? I knew Brent would find those cats. Brent is, I call him the bloodhound. So Brent's with Dean Kahumas, which is brilliant. <clears throat> um, we were with Karula. I decided to move on because we've had a really beautiful morning with Karula and just let her be for a while. Um, she moved up into a very, very tricky place for Brian uh, to get any pictures there and I couldn't manoeuvre the vehicle rather than going over the edge and down into the drainage line and we just wanted to let them be and I think that's one of the great things that we do and all the people uh, that watch animals uh, or view animals around here in Sabi Sands do, you give them some space, you know, just let them be after a while. We've had our time, we've had some beautiful, you know what's up here, you always get some surprises, <clears throat> even if it's just uh, a great sort of overview of, of the area. And uh, 
We've had a really lovely morning. I have to say, if you were with us right from the start this morning on the, the school special, thank you very, very much for being so patient and uh, listening to all the sort of relations, the, uh, all the relationships I was trying to build and the other the team were trying to build with their schooling and their curriculum and things like that and how important it is. And uh, also just how wonderful it is to be back. I really, really appreciate all the support and everyone and all the lovely... Uh, kind words people have said and it's just a great feeling to be sitting in this vehicle driving around with Brian Joubert on the wonderful Juma Game Reserve here in Sabi Sand, South Africa. I just got a message from, uh, I think your handle is Crafting Princess. What's the best part of this job? <clears throat> well, I'm going, to give you a, I'm going to have to give you a few parts. I don't think I can give you one. You always find that with me. Uh, it's very hard to ask a, simple, well, ask a simple question, but I'll give you a convoluted answer back because I just get so excited about being here. There's certain interactions that you have with wildlife that you never forget, and the wildlife is obviously a big draw card and a wonderful thing to come back to. But it's also the people, the team, the, everyone that you come in contact with on Safari Live and the greater area, uh, the people that manage here, the, you know, Candace and Mike Grover and Yuri Mormon and Pippa and all the people and all the different reserves, Arethusa, uh, Cheetah Plains and all the guides. There's a wonderful human interaction that occurs as well as being in the presence of these animals and in this habitat. So it's a two-part sort of answer for me. It's people and wildlife and it's always been like that for me and I learnt that one goes in hand in hand with the other. You cannot have one without the other and in this managed area whether it's us delivering uh, this experience to everyone that's joined us this morning and when you do, or it's the what goes on behind the scenes, there's an incredible team here in final control and all the people that make this happen. So, Crafting Princess, I hope I've answered your question for you. Uh, important, important things that animals work with people and people work with animals. Uh, conservation is all about that. Conservation for me is conversation and you really do have uh, to make sure that that conversation continues because animals can just look after themselves. If they've got the habitat, they're fine. It's when us little humans come into, into, into contact with it, that's, that's what conservation's about. So I am going to say farewell for today. Thank you very, very much for joining us this morning uh, on Safari Live and I'm going to link over back to Jamie and just see what she's up to, but I'm going to jump in the, in the saddle again this afternoon. From Brian, The Thumb and myself, fantastic guys, we'll see you real soon. Mustn't touch the tree that the spider is in. I'm trying to get a good view of him because he is so, or she, is so amazingly camouflaged beautiful bright green and hidden in the sun with long legs and just looking at the anatomy of the spider admittedly upside down from my perspective but looking at her anatomy I would say this is very much an active hunter so like our jumping spiders and, un and like our baboon spiders and unlike things like funnel webs or tent web or community spiders this is a spider that will spend its time actively seeking out whatever food it can find and sitting on this acacia tree it's the perfect green for the leaves. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't run away. Try not to put my shadow on it either. There it goes. Very, very rapid movement, like a, like a jumping spider, but without this robust legs. So an active hunter that might be looking for things like ants, aphids, whatever else happens to be attracted to this acacia tree. And the thing about acacia trees, particularly red acacias, although this is not a red acacia, I'm not sure which one this is, but the thing about them is that they have really very nutrient-rich sap, and that is exuded very readily, which in turn means that it is a host for all kinds of interesting little insect species, and also where our bush babies will go straight towards on a night spent foraging, especially in winter, of course, when there are hardly any insects for them to catch and collect. So there we go for the end of our bushwalk, a lovely spider sighting 
to finish off what's been a really lovely morning out on foot. It is time for us to say our farewells and a big thank you to Jandre, as well as a big thank you to Herbert. Thank you, Herbie. Well done for you. Well done for getting us out of the elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and a big thank you to all of you for joining us. We're going to make our way home because my stomach's been rumbling consistently for the last three hours and it's time for some of Amanda's cooking. We'll see you in a few short hours. Hope you had fun this morning. Bye-bye. So there we go. The lines are all around. And it looks like they're moving into some thick, thick thorns. With my shade for the rest of the day. Okay, so they're heading right into that thicket. The one lioness is still out. Hello, big girl. So a nice spot for them to spend the day. Really thick shade. You can hear them talking in the thickets. Low contact core. You can hear a Franklin spotted them. Yeah, the cubs in the thicket. Ow! Look at this, they're just moving slowly. Hello, little ones. Might head off. There we go. I might have heard something. I did hear some elephants. So maybe they're just trying to move away from where the elephants were. Now, with little cubs, obviously, you don't want elephants getting angry and charging around with you. Oh, looks like they're all on the move now. Uh, they're looking a bit nervous because of the elephants, so we're not going to stay with them. We'll let them calm down and find them again on the Sunset Safari. So, Margaret uh, is uh, saying, are there new times? Well, Margaret, this week there are new times. We'll be starting at 6 a.m. Central African time. Uh, we are doing a, a couple of days special drive uh, for the Taronga Zoo. And it's centenary year, we're taking a whole bunch of Australian schools on safari. I just got to let everyone know that those lines have moved. Those Nkormas have moved east uh, to the, into the block between the Buffalo Cut Line and Sandy Patch Road. I'm going to be leaving the area. So here we go. Hopefully we'll be able to find them on the Sunset Safari. I'm pretty confident we will. I don't think they're going to move too far. I just think they want to get out of that area, which is a sort of thoroughfare for elephants on their way to Sydney's waterhole. Ah, and behind the lines, if they had been paying attention, there were a whole bunch of impala that have moved out onto the open area. But we know those in Kahuma girls, they like buffalo. So it's been fantabulous having you guys on the Sun Rise Safari and also great to have those Australian schools in Taronga Zoo on board for the first hour of the show. Uh, the lions did keep them and I busy, but fortunately our tracking turned into finding at the end of the drive. So a lovely view of those Inkahuma cubs and I'm definitely, definitely sure one of us will definitely try to find them on the Sunset Safari. 
and uh, I'm sure Karula will still be around as well. Hopefully there's still a bit of meat left and if not, she's just gonna go for a drink deeper into, into Juma. Another lovely winter's day here in the South African low felt and uh, in a few hours, we're gonna be doing it all again. Uh, so we're really looking forward to you joining us and uh, hopefully we can find a lot more interesting cats and creatures and bugs and even dung. So from VM and myself and the rest of the Safari Live crew, have a fantastic rest of your day or night or whatever it might be where you are in the world.